but these memories, these pieces of the island's hidden personality to which he felt such a personal connection, were not inactive. The island was not bashful and quiet about its past and about its attributes. It was actively being impregnated by them. The island's body was constantly pregnant, constantly swollen with objects, with the children of its own past and present. Each of these objects contained an essence of the secrets, of the past, of the personality, of those innermost convictions which the island had so tenderly revealed to him, but which through these offspring were spread all over the island's body to every little nook and cranny, to every tourist. The island was communicating itself for the flood of visitors, was creating an atmosphere of itself which, no matter where the visitors went on its body, kept them immersed in its essential flavours. Having transferred his savings to a local bank, he purchased a small and not insalubrious attic flat in the uppermost town and convinced himself that he would one day reconcile his longing for personal possession for a private relationship between him and the place and the reality of its promiscuity. He knew he was being stupid. He knew that he had been drawn to the place by the very photographs which were now making him tremble with jealousy. He knew that he had made the journey there precisely because of its fame, but it stung him to see the island, his island, multiplying itself like some extrovert celebrity. Unfortunately, from the very beginning there was tension as he was forced to do his place up as a small bed and breakfast for tourists this being the only way to really have any type of regular income on the island. He made only a minimal effort to make the bedrooms welcoming and comfortable, but in the largest room, which acted as reception, dining room, lounge and his own study, he tried to capture as much of his island's persona for himself as he possibly could, quite literally annexing quantities of the offspring which infused the landscape. He tried to surround himself in its concentrated form. He thought that if he could bring them together densely enough in his own space, then it would be his, then he could possess its essence. But it wasn't truly his space. He hated that he had to share it all, even in his home, with all these visitors whom he had to serve and smile at. And if that wasn't bad enough, his establishment became famous. He had waiting lists from around the world. Some guidebook, which was published in numerous languages, apparently thought that his bed and breakfast captured the essence of this famous rock with truly idiosyncratic charm, and that, although cramped, it is a must-have atmospheric experience, even if just for one night. It all became too much. In a desperate rage, he closed down the bed and breakfast and smashed all the objects to pieces. And he didn't only smash his own to pieces, but kept stealing them from all over the island, destroying them, and collecting the remaining pieces that were most redolent of the personality he so dearly wanted to keep close to his heart. He wanted to distill the island like he was producing a fine alcohol. Only the most pure and relevant parts would remain. Only the most elementary and evocative would grace his presence. Arranging these most redolent of fragments in endlessly varying combinations, he began to privately, artificially, recreate for himself the island's atmospheric expressions of itself. Here, in private, he could imagine being entirely and exclusively immersed, alone, without babbling visitors, in all the nooks and crannies of its body. But he wanted more than this. He wanted more than to be forever just looking in on miniature reproductions, having to imagine being with his island rather than truly being with it. If he could not totally be enveloped in its personality, then he would only settle for possessing it totally. Compressing the various fragments together, he set about trying to create a complete implosion of the atmosphere of the island. Out of these most obsessively and fastidiously selected pieces, he strove to create an object which, in its concentrated evocative power, could contain, somehow lock within it the island's persona, while at the same time being an independent, a circumscribed thing, something that he could hold in his hands, keep beside his bed, carry around with him under his jacket, and enjoy entirely on his own, possess entirely, be with completely. But he had such a clear image in his head of how this object would feel, of exactly what kind of emotions it should arouse within him when he would hold it in his hands, that no matter how hard he tried, no matter how many attempts he seemed to make, none of his creations lived up to his expectations. For a brief moment... Sometimes an hour, sometimes a day. After producing one, he would be seduced. 
He would be satisfied momentarily by the wealth of places and moments contained within that particular compression. But soon this would wear off, and all that he would be able to see in these things that he held would be what they didn't manage to capture, what they didn't manage to evoke. Each time that disappointment got the better of him, he would discard the perpetrator, throwing it into the distance. Initially, these strange objects were found lying like fossils around the island and taken home by the delighted visitors who happened to stumble upon them. But soon, as the frequency of their appearances increased, a buzzing trade began. Dealers started professionally collecting the discarded objects and selling them on the web to people all over the globe. Although for him none of the little compressions had so far managed to truly capture the power of his beloved isle, for tourists, with their minimal experience of the island, they were pure magic. For them, they truly did capture the island. And so everybody else was satisfied. Everybody else, all around the world, could possess his island in their living rooms, in their bedrooms, in their workplaces, bathrooms, studies, kitchens, halls, and landings. Thousands of people in dozens of countries now had his island releasing its atmosphere into their homes like some spatially evocative air freshener. But the fact that he was making his love more promiscuous than ever didn't occur to him. He didn't care. He was consumed by his search and continued stealing and smashing things from all over the island and reconstituting them, only to be forever momentarily satisfied and ultimately disappointed. Just as the number of objects he produced increased exponentially, so the amount of fragments increased uncontrollably. He would only use the most suggestive pieces, the pieces which would remind him of those secrets and convictions with which he had felt such a close connection, and so the discarded majority piled up around him in irrepressible proliferation. For every time that he made an object, an object that would end up in someone's home as a doorway, a private lobby into the character of his island, for each time that he made one of these, for each time that another proud customer was invited in without ever having to leave their living room, the place itself, where the door opened onto, where the lobby would lead, where the object signified, this place was disappearing, disappearing under a sea of the discarded fragments, under a sea of his frustration. By this time the locals had moved off the island, and it was no longer visited by anyone except a select group of dealers who would land by boat daily to scour the fragment dunes for newly produced objects. He is the sole resident now, alone at last with his island, he is entirely immersed in it, privately. But then there is nothing left of what he had wanted to be alone and in private with, what he had connected to. And so all there is left for him is the search, the vain hope that one day, one of his objects will recreate and capture everything that he remembered, everything that he had loved in the island. The island has metamorphosed. In his hopeless search for it, he has exploded it and gutted it, scattering its innards with the wind to the four corners of the globe. He is now left only with its body, and unknown to him, others have and still continue to sell and disperse around the world its soul.